some great talks so far. Um, I've been uh, looking at the program and um, thinking about all the things that have said today and also um, thinking about what I was going to talk about earlier on. I've changed it up a bit. But the overarching theme, I think, for my talk, and hopefully I can get it all out, is biological robotic entities. I can talk about that a little bit further on. Um, my work usually deals with um, analog technologies, not using uh, digital works, such as computers, because <laughs> they make me nervous. Um, but uh, looking at the program today, and the previous speakers, and possibly the further speakers, I thought there was a bit of a, um, a lack in things uh, talking about how humans feel about interacting with other humans in response to being surrounded by this technology that we find ourselves embracing. Um, robots, automat or automatons, automation, all of these things actually are affecting our, our lives and are affecting how we deal with each other and other humans. So I just want to start off with talking about um, how we deal with not only the robots that we surround ourselves with, but also how do we build a vocabulary on describing the relationships that we have with each other and the robots themselves. Um, and I wanted to, just the, the subtitle there, uh, Robots as Disposable Tools or respected child. I guess that kind of culminates my scattered kind of thoughts at the moment on where I see the main problem. The main problem being that um, we're building these very intelligent uh, objects um, that are getting closer and closer to the way we want them, hopefully close enough that we will be able to invest our feelings in them. Some people think that's a hope. But what do we do when things go wrong? What do we do when uh, um, these entities uh, need to be disposed of? And what do we do when they get so close to us that um, they start to impact uh, how we deal with real wet humans? So, the, um, the, the, to start off with, I'll, I'll talk about the impacts of the automation and robotics. But I think, as other people have talked today, artists are really well placed to, to, to crack open these issues. And this is where I'm finding my work to uh, 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 move into is this um, ability for an artist to take from industry the uh, intelligence and, and smarts that the normal layperson is unable to understand and display it in a way or increase the uh, understanding for the layperson um, so we can build a vocabulary to talk about these things. Um, so, the next slide. What is the appropriate way that we are to deal with the complex artifacts of this control culture that we have? So, as these machines, uh, uh, softwares, things like this get so close to the way that we want them, um, are we really able to deal with the failures, the uh, end of life scenarios um, uh, that come about um, from this interaction? So yes, the, the vocabulary that we really uh, need, we, we yet to have. These aren't uh, animals or humans 
that uh, we are building. These entities are entirely of our own making. And as we move closer and closer to more lifelike action and build closer relations to them, more or less like uh, the second order of cybernetic uh, theory, where now we are observing our own uh, role in the feedback loop. We are part of the machine, but we are also observing our interactions with the machine. So this vocabulary that we, I hope that we can start to talk about and build on um, will find the nuances that uh, is important. So this slide here I found from 1957 and it's talking about slavery. So what does an unpaid worker without rights nor benefits but with a high upfront cost look like? Here in 1957, they were talking about these kind of things. So if the front, maybe you can't read it, but it's a bit, a bit lame. So in 1965, oh, no, sorry. Abe Lincoln freed the slaves, but by 1965, slavery will be back. We'll all have personal slaves again. Only the time, this time, we won't be fighting a civil war over them. Don't be alarmed. We mean robot slaves. So, maybe a little bit controversial, <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I think something that we as artists should think about. Now, I'll rush through, but uh, I'll get to my newest uh, uh, work so far. But this last slide on this particular topic is... Um, so we have a bit of a conundrum. We're building these smarter and smarter machines... Um, and on the other side of the, the conundrum is our hope is for better and better slaves. Some point in history, sorry, some point in the future, I think, um, we are going to have to decide which side of this conundrum is uh, most important to us. So is it possible to dehumanize these unhuman objects that we are building? And when we dehumanize these things that are so close to us, does it devalue the humanity that we have to other people? So a lot of my work up until now, well, the last couple of years, has been about using analog technologies in the way that it moves in a more of a fluid, uh, real-time kind of uh, way. Um, but just recently, in the last three years, I've been working with biological materials. The work that I am yet to uh, finalise, but I've been working on for the last two years, and this is the first time I'm presenting, uh, the working title is called Bricolage. And it's an artistic, autonomous, self-assembling biological entity. So we're using human biological material to build an autonomous structure. Um, I'm working with some, someone you may know, Guy Benari, over in uh, Western Australia. We work together in a wet lab at a lab called Symbiotica at the University of Western Australia. It's a fantastic lab you should come and see. Um, Guy has been working with uh, neural networks, real neural networks growing on uh, petri dishes in an artistic context for, for some time. Like I said, I've been working with analog technologies for some time, almost 20 years. Some of the works we've been working together on have been using uh, robotics and interfacing with uh, human neural networks in the Petri dish. The most recent work that we worked on together is the bottom left there. It's called Self, uh, and it's touring U Europe right now. Uh, it, we will be... Uh, another show, the, our next show is in September in the Hague, in um, today's art music festival. Basically what self is, is a brain neuron a network growing on a petri dish, and uh, we have a read-write interface, all analog electronics, uh, composing sound from the neural activity. And uh, this sound is played out in space, 
uh, a live human musician interacts with the neurons and plays a, like a, it's a live jamming semi-living instrument so we like working with the uh, natural biological materials and we're trying to talk about and build vocabulary about what we're working with so of course natural intelligence the things that we know uh, also animals that uh, display intelligence we have artificial intelligence which we all are talking about today and uh, something that uh, we are working on, Guy and I, together, is uh, in vitro intelligence. So the real uh, crux of the work that we're working with, we want to talk more about the actual material that we are using. So the slide that you see here, the move, is what we've uh, generated in the lab. Um, we have human uh, cardiac heart cells twitching in a dish. Um, and basically, my eyesight is really bad, so I'll just read over here. Bricolage represents the shift in that the focus of this project is not about the control of robot bodies, but about the liveliness of biological matter through the physical movement inherent in muscle cells, human uh, heart muscle cells, and their visceral behavior. So we chose heart muscle cells because they twitch and move autonomously uh, there is no uh, uh, brain uh, interconnection needed. Um, we, uh, I'll tell you about the process as we go through. Uh, so we chose this material because instantly it has a visceral effect when you see it. And you can see it with the naked eye. But uh, we uh, also uh, want to work with age-old technologies uh, as well. And... Um, so the three real uh, materials that we're working with here is blood, heart, and silk. So on the left, you see uh, uh, blood drops on silk. And uh, on the right, you see a twitching heart cells that I, I made on a substructure. Uh, now, both the movies are the same materials. Um, but through biological alchemy and, and working in the lab, we are able to change the feeling and, and uh, um, impact of those materials and develop a, um, an automaton. So on the right, so you see the pockmark structure underneath the twitching cells, and that's actually silk. Um, uh, we've uh, uh, used aqueous silk, so liquefied silk. I'll explain the process a little bit further. And um, so we have silk, heart, and uh, blood. Uh, the blood uh, from um, in, on the right-hand slide is uh, how where we derive the stem cells. So making heart muscle cells from blood. So we take uh, IPS cells uh, that derive from uh, cord blood. So I was able to buy uh, these stem cells online. And uh, there are uh, YouTube videos on how and what you need to differentiate from stem cells along the lineage to uh, twitching heart cells. Uh, this was an early uh, um, thing that we did. We actually bought, but now we have uh, relations with the universities in Berlin and uh, East Coast Australia um, uh, that help us with their own cells. So, Cord blood is reverse engineered using IPS as a Japanese technology that's about 10 years old. Um, it's called induced pluripotency. And uh, so from IPS, you can go to any cell that you may wish, an eye cell, a skin cell, a hair cell, uh, a heart cell, uh, a brain cell that we did with uh, the previous project. So um, with bricolage, we are taking blood, uh, going to IPS, and here's an IPS stem cell. Uh, multiples of them, and uh, now we are working with uh, Sebastian uh, Dieck at um, Stem Cell Core Research Facility in Berlin, and uh, he is helping us uh, differentiate into strong twitching cells. And this is one of the ones that we first used about uh, a year and a half ago. I call this uh, the the twerking twitch. <laughs> looks, looks like a <laughs> looks like a man twerking. Um, so uh, we're through uh, about a week and a half or to two weeks of cell culture. We can turn um, IPS stem cells 
into twitching cells on a dish. But the artwork, of course, uh, there were many things that I needed to uh, finalise uh, still now, but uh, basically we wanted to have the uh, twitching cells on a substructure and be visible to the naked eye. So this is one of the first uh, movies that I made where it was actually visible to the naked eye. This is zoomed in with a, uh, with a camera, of course, but um, in the dish you were able to see it with a naked eye. So... Um, and here again, you can see it with the naked eye. So it's quite uh, confronting when you see it in real, pers in, in real life. Uh, and this is what we want. We want to see how um, people react when they see real living matter uh, create a, a physical movement. Um, now the process of actually building the bodies, I'll show you basically the, the way that we do. Um, as an artist, as most of you know, we use technology and machines that, uh, in a way that they're not supposed to be used. Uh, luckily at Symbiotica in the uh, uh, University of West Australia, we, we have access to some very high-end high microscopes and technology. Um, we have a motorised uh, microscope that uh, is able to take uh, multiple pictures of a, of a dish, uh, and you can program where it takes a picture. On the left, you see uh, basically the path of where I wanted the uh, uh, um, photos to be taken. And each pixel is about uh, 10 microns, very small. Um, I'm not using the camera to take pictures, I'm using the flash of light. So when the camera takes a picture, it, it, uh, it shines a light on the Petri dish. In the middle you can see the placing of the um, uh, Petri dish with the liquefied aqueous silk in the middle. And inside the aqueous silk, I have a photosensitive uh, compound that jellifies the silk uh, when it's been hit by the light of the camera. So going through the path of the uh, micro movements of the, the camera, I'm able to expose the, um, uh, um, uh, expose the uh, liquefied silk and solidify the um, uh, silk to uh, a shape that is predetermined. Um, okay, so this is the first examples of, of the heart uh, on silk. It's a crude prototype that I did maybe about a year ago. Um, and uh, this is via a microscope. So, but basically what we're thinking about is actually having it uh, visible to the naked eye. Uh, and the last uh, um, uh, experiment that we did is actually visible. So we have the silk structure underneath and uh, with twitching heart cells placed on top. And we have a, a biological automaton that is uh, visible to the naked eye. So the idea of this is also to have it in a self-assembly mode. So I'm using uh, um, the ideas of uh, normal roboticists and swarm activity. Um, we'll be uh, treating uh, each of these, making multiples of these size automatons. Six mil, you can see by the ruler there. It's about six mil by six mil. But uh, we want to be able to uh, link them up in a dish, in, an, uh, in a gallery space, and we're using something called DNA origami. DNA origami is, is a way of actually bonding things together uh, uh, using base pairs of DNA. So we're treating, this is not uh, the silk, this is just jelly uh, cubes of similar size. And each side of the jelly, different sizes, are uh, treated with certain base pairs of DNA. And through vibration and swimming, hopefully, uh, of the, uh, the um, uh, silk structures in media, uh, we will be able to construct a architectural sized device of multiple uh, twitching uh, scaffolds and actually um, uh, produce something much larger but also um, much more interesting to see. Um, I have a show booked for this particular artwork uh, March next year in uh, Helsinki. Um, I'm on track to actually do it. So there's a few uh, hurdles to do, but uh, um, if, uh, if you're in the neighbourhood, uh, please look it up. So uh, the working title is Bricolage, but maybe that will change. Um, it's exciting to be here. There's one last 
kind of slide that I like this uh, quote. It's from uh, Mark Dion. The variety and variability of life is a wonder of infinite complexity. There is no more curious and uncanny topic than the biodiversity that surrounds us. The objective of the best art and the best science is not to strip nature of wonder, but to enhance it. So I wanted to, I want to really uh, um, uh, stamp out that I think it's important as artists and scientists that um, we uh, uh, tie our work uh, and our thinking to the real basic biological world around us in order for us to uh, not create an unhinging or create a, more of a coupling effect from here into the future. So, thank you.